Hey, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Chuck Nix, the Bearded Wino. And you know what? We're back again with some more events for Bravo Italian Restaurant Bar. Uh, look, here's what, got, here's what we got going on. At Bravo, uh, we do wine events. And I'm the sommelier, yeah, I'm the service manager. You all know that I'm a passionate individual and I love fermented grape juice. Uh, so what I like to do is we like to put together these events uh, following in the great tradition of all those that came before me. Uh, so our events that are we're moving forward for the rest of the year are going to be no different than they have been before, except for that we plan to elevate the experience for you and all of your attendees. So uh, this next event that we'll be holding at Bravo will be on May 15th. That is the day after Mother's Day. Uh, so that's a Monday afternoon or Monday evening, I'll say 6.30 p.m. Uh, you'll get your tickets at bravobuzz.com. Uh, if you are not on our email list, be sure to shine up. Uh, to be on our email list at www.bravobuzz.com and you'll click the contacts link and make sure you give us your email address and we can start notifying you for all events coming forward. Uh, you'll show up. It's going to be a trade style tasting. We'll have tables uh, that will have wine. We'll have some tables with some food um, and we're going to pour some really, really cool wines. Uh, so let's talk about the wines that we're pouring. Yes, we are an Italian restaurant, so it's only fitting that one of the events that we plan uh, this summer are going to feature some really, really interesting Italian wines and unique, but still classic. Uh, and some things that haven't been exposed to our market as of yet. Uh, my friend Giorgio Bava, a uh, Bavo family, a Bavo winery in Piedmonte, uh, are some magnificent wines and some classic expressions of some of your favorite uh, Piedmont wines. Yes, we're talking Barbera. Yes, we're talking about Nebbiolo. And we're talking about it in Longue fashion, but also even more defined in Barolo uh, that you all know. We love the king of wines, right? Uh, but we also have some really, really cool Piemonte white wines. And I'm not leaving out my sweet wine drinkers because for all of you who love Moscato, you know that I'm going to tell you that the best expression of Moscato is going to come from the Asti region in Piemonte. So we're going to talk about that today with my friend Giorgio. So look, we're going to check in with him. We're going to make sure that uh, you all are informed on what's happening on May 15th at 6 p.m., at Bravo Italian Restaurant. That's the Monday after Mother's Day. And you'll go to www.bravo.com uh, to bravobuzz.com to sign up and make sure you get your uh, seats reserved. So let's check in with Bravo right now and let's see what he's got going on. I'm pretty sure he's drinking all these wines right now. Giorgio, how are you? Ciao, ciao, ciao. Tutto bene, tutto bene. Tu come stai? Bene. <laughs> Things good? are great. Things are great. <laughs> Things are fantastic. I thought this was in Italian. Sorry, I didn't really get that. I, we don't speak in re much English in here, but like we we'll try. We we'll, we'll use our hands and try to understand each other. Very good. You know what? I use my hands a lot too, and it gets me in trouble sometimes on the service floor. I don't like to knock any wine glasses over. <laughs> yes, but wine, wine glasses are there to be used, okay? And part of their use is to be knocked over because it makes everybody happy. Everybody start clapping, everybody order another glass. If you come to Italy, you come to a, a restaurant, people will start clapping and, and make friends with you. So it's not a problem. And man, look, I'm glad talking, I'm glad to talk to you today. Look, um, I, me and you have been chopping it up. You know, I'm in Dallas. I'm at the Texan Wine Conference, which I do every year. You are busy uh, in, in Piedmont right now. What's going on with you out there in Italy? We are mostly hoping for a bit of rain. Right? It's been, it's been a very cold, uh, cold spring, and we didn't have much rain. But look, we are, to be frank, we are, we are looking at the, the outdoor window, uh, waiting for rain, and we are planning a lot of trips. Because now me, my, me and my father will start traveling the same day I'll come to the States. And at the same time, he will go to Jakarta, I think. Jakarta, uh, Singapore. Uh, looks like people want uh, uh, good wines. So we're constantly traveling. So that's what we're doing at the moment. Well, yes, people want good wines. And it's a good thing that you all provide them. So we're happy that you guys are doing the work. Well, we're hoping for some rain for you. We'll do a little rain dance here in Mississippi <laughs> to see if we can get that happening uh, across the pond here. So look, yeah. let's just talk a little bit about it because I'm going to pour, me and you, we're going to pour a bunch of wines here in May uh, for the folks here in Mississippi. Um, tell me a little bit about Bava Winery. Let's talk to other people about it. You guys have been making wine in Piemonte for how long? Um, we are kind of uh, new in the Italian uh, scene because we have something like 110, 115 years, uh, which in Italy is kind of the basic. Like uh, when you go to Vin Italy, the big wine fair, if you don't have at least 100 years of history, it's like, oh, that's a newbie. Oh, new, new kids on the block. So we, have, we, we were born in uh, 1911. 
uh, so that's 112, um, as a company, as a winery. Yeah. Uh, but the family has been actually be, been making wine since the 1600s. Uh, so our family used to have a farmhouse in a hill that I see just outside the window there um, with lands. So we were making, uh, we, were, we had a couple of cat, uh, cows, we had uh, crops and wine. Um, and this has been proven. We, we have all the documents from the church, the church registry, because the family never moved for 400 years from the same not even the village is like the, the periphery of a village. Uh, we could trace back all the history there. But in 1911, we set up a winery, start selling wine, uh, more like the wine in bottle, not just for our own consumption and consumption of the farmers uh, around us. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the history. That's where we are in Piemonte. Um, yeah. Piemonte in, uh, we are in the Monferrato area. We are proud Monferrato people, uh, which is this hill area to make it simple, it's between uh, Milan and Turin, to make it simple. Uh, beautiful, beautiful area, full of vineyards, but also there is a lot of diversity. There is a lot of forest, a lot of trees, a lot of crops. It's, it's a cool area in uh, Lange. So we also have, uh, we play with uh, three different estates, and one of them is in Barolo, in the Lange area. That's where we make our Nebbiolo. So that's... Yeah. Uh, that's Baba. Well, you got you got the best stuff going on, and um, I love that. I love that we talked about that, and I love the relativity that you made it right. So your family's been growing grapes since the 1600s, uh, but you've been a winery since 1911, right? Yeah. Uh, that that makes a lot of it, it really opens a lot of people's eyes, right? Because yes, you're an old family, right? You're generations old and centuries old, um, doing things in Piemonte, but the winery young, which would mean a couple of things, right? So you guys, with your uh, with your history, you know what's expected out of Piemonte, and, and you guys are legitimate, right? There's not you're not new kids on the block, as you recommended. If you're under 100 years old, look in in the United States, we have wineries that are you know 30, 40, 50 years old, and they're considered legacy wineries, you know, for us in the United States. Um, but you guys are so official. I like, literally going back to 1600s, your statement, the place in, that you've held in that space. That's what I think legitimizes you, and that's also why I think that your wines. Look, I tasted through them. Your wines are distributed through Mad Vines here in Mississippi. I tasted through them, and the first thing that I noticed, I was like, "These are classic styles. These are styles that I would be tested on in an exam. These are the styles of wine that I think really truly speak to the terroir of the space." Um, and you mentioned a little bit about being in Montferrato in a hilly area. Let's talk a little bit about that terroir and the geography there, right? We got some hills there. Uh, talk to me a little bit about aspect and sun exposure over the different uh, vine vineyards that are that are placed there. Uh, talk yeah. to me about Nebbiolo, right? Uh, obviously, we know the fog is there, but what does the sun exposure look like for the development of character in the grape skins? That's uh, you. You go. You go straight to the challenging questions. You know, uh, that's the big conversation now. It's there are some grape varieties that are a bit more resistant, that are a bit more flexible. Nebbiolo is delicate, it's so delicate. It's like an overly delicate Pinot Noir. Uh, and that's why it's not like Nebbiolo will never be Cabernet Sauvignon, it will never be a variety that is planted every, everywhere in the world, or that will give amazing results everywhere. Because again, it's extremely delicate to grow and it's extremely delicate to vinify and then even to age. Um, so, back to your question, sorry, uh, heat uh, bec is, has become one of the conversation points between producers and generally in the industry here, because it's not a variety that likes hot temperature. Um, what the interesting thing is that, well, Nebbiolo, um, the word comes from the word Nebbia, which means fog, uh, because it was the variety that was vinified, harvested during the foggy time, so late autumn, it's still now is the last, um, the last uh, grape to, to be picked. Um, Nebbiolo. So this tells you something. It tells you that it takes so long to actually grow, and it likes cold temperature because it takes so long and it does not want. When you taste a Nebbiolo, when you taste a Barolo, you don't get overly ripened. You don't get sugar. You get right. uh, if it's a well-made one, you get freshness. You get uh, uh, floral, you get uh, uh, well, if it's a Barolo, you also get some good aging, 
we have our, our philosophy there with aging we go there later if you want but the viola you you really want zinginess lightness you want structure you want depth but it does not mean sugar so if you cook it if you cook this grape that's not what you get um you get a cooked fruit so it's now getting a bit of an issue because the temperature here are getting really hot piemonte is an area that has very big variety very big, uh, sorry, it can go very low in temperature, minus 15 uh, Celsius. Um, you do the, the maths, uh, I, don't, I don't really remember the Fahrenheit. Um, but in winter, it uh, snows heavily, and in summer, it's super hot. It's overly 35, 40 Celsius degrees. Wow. Really, really hot. Um, wow. Now it's getting more and more. So now summer is getting longer, and the snow times are getting shorter. Uh, so back to your point what used to be the best possible vineyards for the Biolo, for Barolo, now they may be too hot. So it used to be uh, southern, uh, a vineyard exposed to the south for Nebbiolo or east, I don't know, uh, was fantastic. The best crew of Barolo are very well sunny, really, really sunny. Now in those crew, we need to work so that we need to do a lot of canopy management. So we need to let the, the leaves cover the bunch in order not to get them overcooked. So what, what used to be uh, an exposure, like a, a, a Western exposure or an Eastern exposure, that was like borderline for Nebbiolo. Now people are looking for it. And producers are buying grapes northern and northern. In the North Piemonte, there are a lot of producers from Barolo that are purchasing vineyards because it's colder. Wow. So well, you know, that's, so I, I got to say that's, so as a school, as an, a student and academic, that gets really geeky and I really start to think about, you know, we're going to be looking more at expressions of Nebbiolo coming out of the north, having more of that style where it's lighter, uh, fresher, but still holding its tannic expression, that structure that holds up to those heavier meals, but the acid and freshness that's there for anything a little bit lighter and delicate, like it, it's so versatile. Uh, the way that this fruit is available in a bottle, right? From the way that you all are farming it. Um, that's magnificent. That was a lot of great information, Giorgio. And I, I wanted to like, listen to that answer again and like study it because it, it, for students and academics, I want to talk to those folks that are maybe watching that are studying for certifications at this point. We have to understand that uh, vintage expression is real. It's, it's part of a uh, terroir. And if we're looking at longer vintages, considering climate change, because considering things are getting warmer uh, across the world, uh, that we have to understand that things that we knew that we studied in books from, you know, a decade ago or even before, we have to understand that that's probably changing now and that the further north you're getting or maybe sun exposure is a real thing to be concerned about when you're talking about places, uh, especially like Monferrato. I want to talk about this because you mentioned about aging. Um, now, one thing that's always uh, for a lot of consumers, it's a thing, a, a point of, of it's something that they pay attention to, uh, aging. We know that Barolo has to go through how much uh, aging in barrel before release. So that's uh, 30 months. 30 months. All right, so we're going to spend that much time in barrel before it even goes to bottom, right? 32, 36. And you all are aging pretty much longer than 30. 30 is the minimum. You are aging longer than that, am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we do, uh, sorry, um, it's a minimum three years from the harvest in general of aging. It can be bottle and barrel, but we do a minimum of three years in barrel. So that's a, sorry, I'm, I misunderstood that. Um, so you can get already in the market now 23, you're getting already 2019. That's the vintage already on the, on the, um, in the market. We are soon getting 2020. Um, but what we do, we do a minimum of three years in the in the barrel because we use uh, big barrels, simple, yeah. and we use used oak. So that's that's kind of really key in what we do, and you need to understand what Barolo is and uh, how to play with. Because Barolo is a variety that is heavily tannins. Nebbiolo is a grape that grieves a lot of tannins. Um, there are two ways of making it smoother. The, the small barrique, small barrels way, you get a lot of uh, uh, soft tannins, you get a bit of vanilla, you get it fatter, you use a bit of sugar, uh, from, not sure the sugar, but you get a bit of uh, softness coming from the, from the wood to make it bolder and therefore easier to enjoy, or you use thyme. 
use time, you, the, the, the tannins will get softened, there's going to be polymerization there, and they will breathe, and, but it takes time. We are on that front. So uh, I don't like the expression traditionalist, uh, classic, or so on. We have our own style. And for us, our style is, uh, again, one of our mantra is that wood is not really an ingredient. We don't use wood. We don't want wood flavors. We use wood and barrels to let the wine breathe and evolve. Yep. Uh, because you cannot get uh, an evolution from steel tank. St a steel tank tend to be tend to hold that flavors from the harvest. Um, a wooden barrels have exchange of air, therefore it will evolve. Our Barolo has this softness because it did evolve through a big barrel. Uh, we use um, 53 hectoliters barrels. They're very big. They are. I don't really know how to how to show them, but I like. In, well, it's more or less uh, two meters uh, diameter. They are vertical, easier to, and they are taller than me. Um, just to give an, an idea for, for the size. But uh, what we want there is not this woody vanilla influence. It's just to let it soften, and that's what that's what we do in our Barolo. So what you taste there is only the vintage, the terroir, and literally the, the work that we've done in the vineyard itself. Yeah. The the, no, it makes a ton of sense. Uh, and the philosophy behind it really sings to integrity behind the brand. This is why I'm really excited to present y'all's wines. Look, when they were brought to me, I sat at the bar, I tasted through a lineup. Uh, I chose the ones that I thought that were really going to sing to our consumership. Um, I was really, really excited to hear when uh, that the wines were coming. I was super excited to hear that you were coming. And you're taking time out of your busy schedule. This is a busy time of year for you. I know it's growing season, uh, but you are in sales at Baba. Am I am I right? Yeah. I'm lucky because I'm lucky because my I have a big family. So we are uh, seven people in the winery. Uh, in a winery of uh, twenty two people, twenty five people, twenty. Well, uh, including everybody in the vineyard. So we're quite uh, family focused, family heavy. Uh, and because I have, yeah, my father does export as I do. Um, then I have the two uncles that are working in the vineyards in the winery. Then my sister that does a bit more marketing administration. My grandfather, who's actually 93 years old now and still coming to the winery every single day and still uh, being the president and deciding things. Uh, yeah, he's a, uh, he's, he is really energetic, way more energetic than, uh, than I am. And then there is my cousin who's uh, support helping with the management of the properties, you know, these contracts, bureaucracy. So, yeah, that is a big family. So that's why Dude, I could talk. That is fantastic. I love the fact that this is a family winery. This is this is literally vine to glass that we're about to taste. And I, I can't express how happy I am that we are able to present this to the folks here in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, look, if you are checking in right now or wherever you're streaming this, this is uh, Giorgio Bava with Bava Winery uh, of the Bava family in Piemonte, oh. Italy. We're talking about a magnificent event that's coming to Bravo Italian Restaurant uh, and Grill in Jackson, Mississippi, in Highland Village, uh, Monday, May 15th, the day after Mother's Day. We're going to be pouring some wines. Uh, Chef Matt Mabry is going to put together some food and some snacks for us to eat. And we're going to have a really open forum where we're walking around the restaurant. It's going to be yours. We're going to taste some magnificent wines. So we're talking about um, Barolo. We're talking about all the other things that are happening in Barbera. We're talking about things that are happening, that they're growing. Uh, we're talking about this event. So, um, Giorgio, I really got to dig into this part of it because people are really interested. Um, I have a lot of, in the South, a lot of our food has a lot of seasoning, has a lot of spice. And we know that one of the things that pairs best with spice or seasonings is sometimes sugar. Um, mm -hmm. But we also have to understand that there's a reverence and a regard for dry wine globally. But, um, you know, there's a trend for sweet wine drinkers. And I think that there's expressions of sweet wines that we, you and I know is people that understand wine and other people in the industry and the trade understand that there are some wines that have some reverence that are still sweet. And you all are doing a great expression of that with the Moscato, but Moscato Dasti and not a different expression of Moscato. Before I let you get into this, I want to explain just to some people watching. There's Moscato uh, from the Moscato grape that is uh, grown in other areas of the world. Moscato d'Asti, specifically coming from the Asti area in the Piemonte, is the, I'll say, true 
classic expression of this grape and prepared in a sweeter fashion. Uh, Giorgio, tell me a little bit about your Moscato Dasti uh, and the philosophy behind it, because I love it. I love it. It's a little bit effervescent. It's got some spritz to it. It's fantastic. You tell me what you're thinking. Tell me about it. Because it's something I actually discovered when I came to the States the first time, because I, uh, I started this job only uh, two years ago, before I was, uh, I was in, in, in UK selling whiskey. Because my, my the family sent me away and do what I could make my own experience. Oh, welcome, back. welcome back, Georgia. We're happy to have you back. <laughs> I got a, my father. My father was like, "Oh, you know, you could you could go to the states. You, uh, I, we need you there." And, and to be frank, I kind of miss this place a little bit. To be frank, so that's why I, I, I came back uh, after eight years there. And yeah, it's it's a nice place. It's a really nice place. We are one hour from the mountains skiing, one hour from the seaside. We're in the middle of the beautiful countries. I knew it so well for no money. And after being in London for so long, I was so fed up of not being able to actually have like a proper steak, a proper piece of bread every day. And so I was like, guys, good cheese. So, so much good. It must feel anyway. good. Um, so what I discover uh, coming to the state, uh, I'm very good at going outside topic, but that's a different story. Uh, what I discover is Moscato has, you have an opinion on Moscato that I never heard of, because the only Moscato that I could find in Italy and in Europe is Moscato d'Asti, or good quality Moscato, Moscadel uh, from France, or other forms of Moscato from maybe Mediterranean areas, aromatic varieties. Um, while Moscato is a word I understand that actually is often synonymous with a sweet mass-produced wine. Sorry, but it's not. Um, yes, it's very easy to make a sweet wine. It's very easy. The easiest thing ever. But making a wine that does not tire your palate, that actually refresh you. And what you want from a good Moscato is refreshment. You don't want sugar. You want to be refreshed. You want to drink the glass of Moscato, and then you don't want the need to actually go and have a glass of water. Because this is not a sugar juice. This is not a sugar um, syrup. After you drink only sugar syrup, you need to refresh your palate. What you want from this thing is actually to be refreshed. Um, so the key here, I almost want to call it a dry wine. It is not dry, but it has a dry finish. And this is super important. We're going to do this game when we are there in Mississippi together. And we're actually going to drink it. And then we're going to be like, OK, swallow it. Very good. Now focus there. You don't have sugar left. You have an aromatic feeling. You get almost fruit, tropical fruit. You get aya. But what you had there was actually acidity and aromatic. Yes, they, they were sugar. Fine, but the key is to make an acidic and dry finish wine. And this is super important in a good quality Moscato because a sweet Moscato, easy, so it's super easy. A Moscato that actually has a good finish that you actually, that calls for another glass, that's not it, that's not easy. And this is really the key for Moscato last year. Um, I'm I'm 100% with you. I, I love the way you're thinking about Moscato that I see and a wine that you want to drink that's refreshing, so investing that you don't, it's not cloying. It's not so weighty on the palate. I mean, look, there's some appeal to that, right? But if, if that's what you want, then we're really talking about a, a different kind of wine, something that may be fortified, something that may be, uh, you know, a pasamento method or something of the sort. That's a different style of wine. And I think that when we are drinking sweet wines and we're talking about sweet wines, um, I think we have to talk about what style is sweet and what are we doing with it, right? A beverage has a purpage, beverage for food, or are we just talking about beverage to indulge in? You know, if you're doing with something indulgent, then maybe, yeah, you do want something cloying and a little bit syrupy that's weighty on the palate. That's a different thing. But if I'm eating something that's got some spice in it, for instance, at Bravo, we have a dish that has um, some spice in it. It's a catfish and grits. Catfish is the, the, um, it's the vegetable of Mississippi. <laughs> I'll say that, right? <laughs> You know, catfish is everywhere, but, it, it, you know, we do it with a spice fashion. There's some andouille sausage in there, uh, some corn, some bell pepper. There's some things that really uh, are spicy, they elevate on the palate, some capsaicin that touches on the palate. You want something sweet to balance it out. And I want something refreshing also because there's some weight from the oils and the grease that are in that dish that comes with the truffle polenta. All those this things make sense if you have something with them, it's got a dusty. 
right? It's, it's bright, it's effervescent, it's fresh, but it's still got some uh, sweetness, some perceivable ripeness to it. But it's not something that weighs you down so much so that it's uh, that it's so hedonistic that you really need water after you, you drink and, and, and then eat the food, right? So your expression on Moscato that Bava produces, uh, I'm excited to present that, that to people. And look, it's hot outside. Nobody wants to drink something that's so weighty. You want something that's a little bit fresh and, and refreshing uh, when it's hot outside. So I'm really excited about that, yeah. And it's super interesting. Like I, I, I didn't know about your, your cuisine much. What I mean is I didn't know, I'm not an expert in the Mississippi uh, cuisine because I, I, I never been there actually. Uh, but I heard of this uh, recipe before when we were talking and it makes total sense. And the beauty of wine is not being totally strict in one style, in one construct. Okay, this is Italian, Piedmontese uh, um, wines. I need to have them with meat and with truffles. Boring. Not only, like the beauty of wine is actually to adapt them to the local dish with spice, which is not something that we have in Piemonte at all. I don't know even where I could get a catfish in here. And spiciness, my tolerance to, to hot spices is extreme. Like milk for me is already quite spicy, but that's a different story. Uh, and it makes total sense. Like Moscato, it would be perfect, especially something that uh, has this drier finish that cleans away you get the spiciness, the hot, you get the fatness of the fish, and these refresh you, so cleans away the fat, and then plus the sweetness rebalance the, the spice. It makes total sense. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. Um, so I'm, I'm really I'm really super excited to have you coming in. Um, so look, um, I can't wait to have you on May 15th, uh, the Monday after Mother's Day at Bravo Italian Restaurant. Look, for all those that are checking in, uh, go to bravobuzz.com. Uh, make sure you uh, click the events tab. Get your reservation to come see me. Bravo's gonna, uh, Giorgio's going to be pouring. Uh, we got some folks from Mad Vines that are going to be there as well. You'll see your favorite servers, bartenders, and chefs in the space. Uh, we appreciate your support for Southern Wine Culture. Look, we've got some great things coming down the line. I want you all to make sure you all checking in on the website and on our blog to make sure that you know what we got going on down the line. Georgia, I appreciate your time, man. I know you're busy. You got to get it back out there and hustle some bottles. Uh, just to give you guys a rundown that are coming to check us out on Monday, May 15th uh, at 6 p.m., we're going to be pouring the Moscato. We'll be pouring the Gavi, uh, Gavi to Gavi, the Cortese grape. We didn't even talk about that, so my dry white wine drink, because I got something for you, too. Uh, and for, yep, you got it? Look at it. Got He's it. got it in place, ready to rock. <laughs> So we got uh, some Cortese great Gabi to Gabi is going to be poured, some Moscow is going to be poured, some uh, Nebbiolo is going to be poured uh, from overarching Longa area, as well as some Brolo, King of Wines. We're going to pour some Barbera in a great fashion. Look, we got something for everybody. Matt's going to put together some awesome food. Uh, I'm going to be back in Jackson just a little bit. So all of you all that are coming to Bravo, I can't wait to see you guys and tell you all my stories from Texom. I'm in Dallas right now. Giorgio, uh, give me something. What do you want the people to know about Bravo Winery before we get out of here? Uh, very good point. Um, <laughs> family, Italy, modern, definitely, but with a very, very deep root. So we know how to deal with uh, wines, we know how to work the vineyards, but at the same time, we are ready to go on, a, on an airplane. And this is the beauty of uh, the classicity of Italian and Piedmontese wines that actually we know we are in 2023. We know we can drink uh, Moscato with catfish. So let's make people think outside the box. Let's bring the, the Barolo and uh, take away the truffle. It's not truffle season and try with different weird uh, local uh, products and make people think I can get this bottle and drink it in a different way that uh, that Italian chef has never told me. Let's see, let's see how it works. Let's make people experiment and have fun. That's what you do with wines. Because in the end, as, as you said, it's fermented grape juice. It's fermented yes, grape juice, man. It's easy. It's just like that. <laughs> hey, Georgia, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we'll see you all Monday, May 15th, 6 p.m. at Bravo Italian Restaurant. Giorgio and I and some other folks from Mad Vines are going to be pouring some magnificent wines from Bava Winery and Bava Family Wines. Thank you so much. I'll talk to y'all soon. We will see y'all Monday, May 15th. Peace, y'all. Ciao, ciao. Ciao a tutti.